And so a great big welcome to you on this glorious Easter Sunday as we celebrate, as we are again reminded of our Lord who blasted out of that tomb, who is now no longer dead, but is alive and living in the hearts and lives of people everywhere. Glad that you're with us today. I know some of you at home, uh, sipping your coffee in your bathrobes, and there'll be many in the church on Easter Sunday. It's always a packed house. But whoever we are, we are God's people, and we're just glad to have you with us. Uh, the story today is uh, about Mary Magdalene and her uh, going to the tomb on that early Easter morning to uh, to give her last respects and to uh, take care of the body of what she thought was her dead dead Lord. And she finds the tomb empty and just uh, thinks that someone has stolen the body. And she actually gets to meet Jesus, though she doesn't know it's him at the beginning. Uh, and then she, the moment he says her name, she realizes who it is. Um, and she goes back and they tell all the other disciples. And their hearts are just filled with great joy. Because they thought that the one who had died now lives. Um, we, I hope today is a good reminder for all of us that our Lord is not a dead Lord, but he's alive and living in the hearts and lives of people everywhere. And throughout this, uh, the whole planet today, uh, bells are ringing, uh, celebrating this resurrection of our Lord. And we're so grateful that uh, he is a truly alive and that he's among us and within us and around us, guiding and directing us. So I hope today is a very meaningful uh, day for you. Um, that wherever you are, be it in church or at home, that together we can uh, worship and celebrate our uh, truly our risen Lord. So with that said, let me begin the service now in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Let me continue with the prayer of the day. And so let us pray. And so to you, O God of mercy, we no longer look for Jesus among the dead, for he is alive and has become the Lord of life. Increase in our minds and hearts the risen life we share with Christ, and help us to grow as your people toward the fullness of eternal life with you. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, we worship and praise one God, now and forever. And all God's people said, Amen. God bless you. He is risen indeed. Now turn the service over to our music team as they share their gifts of music.
And so our gospel lesson for this Easter Sunday, so in the 20th chapter of the Gospel of John, beginning with verse 1. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb. We do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. When Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb, he saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. And the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scriptures, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head, the other at the feet. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, They have taken away my Lord. I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. And Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them, and she told them that he had said these things to her. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And so grace and peace you from God our Father and from the Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. And so let us pray. Lord, as we gather on this awesome Easter Sunday, oh Lord, we give you thanks that you blessed from that grave and that you now live and reside in our hearts and our lives. Oh Lord, come. Fill us with your resurrection love and power this very special day. I pray now that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleased in your sight. In this I pray. Amen. And so welcome. Welcome on this glorious Easter Sunday. It is one of the greatest days in the Christian calendar. For he has risen. He has risen indeed. <laughs> I love saying that. It is a great day for great joy. It's a day to celebrate, a day to give thanks. And now we know that the greatest enemy of all, that of death, has truly been conquered. But I know on that Easter morning long ago, the followers of Jesus, so let's just say they weren't so happy. They all felt pain and anguish for the one that they had loved had died that horrible death on the cross. I suspect we all know what that's like, anyone who's ever lost a loved one. But I don't know how much it hurts to lose a parent, a brother, a sister, a husband, wife, friends, even children. It is that same pain and anguish that I'm sure is how our disciples must have felt on that Easter morning. Here he'd been crucified, he had died, and now he laid in a borrowed tomb. His family and friends and disciples were overwhelmed with grief. Their hearts were broken. They were in a state of disbelief. They felt like they'd been kicked in the chest. And on top of that, some of them were afraid. Disciples, or should I say the male disciples, were in hiding, afraid that if they came out that they too would be crucified as well. When our gospel lesson for this day, we're told that it is Mary Magdalene, on the other hand, who has made it straight to the tomb on that Sunday morning. She's the one that Jesus had cast seven demons out. She had lived a tortured existence for years, and only Jesus had been able to set her free from the evil that had plagued her all her life. She more than anyone else owed Jesus a huge debt of gratitude. Now she was going to the tomb to attempt to see the body of her beloved Lord one last time. I'm sure she felt grief-stricken, confused, shocked, and wondered what was going to happen now that Jesus was gone. I'm sure she yearned to hear his voice again, to see his face. She felt the loneliness, the despair, the pain that we all feel when a loved one dies. 
and add to all this the distress she must have felt when she got to the tomb, and she finds it open. The stone has rolled her away, and worse, and worse than that, Jesus' body was gone. This is just way too much for her. It wasn't bad enough that Jesus was dead, and she was never going to see or hear him again. But now someone had taken his body away. Do you ever stop to wonder why that stone was rolled away? I guess it's just natural to accept that it's part of the story, that God rolled it away or an angel rolled it away. But why? Certainly not so that Jesus could get out. Jesus didn't need to walk out through an open doorway. I can assure you that it wasn't for Jesus' benefit. It was for ours. It wasn't so Jesus could get out. It was so others could get in and to see that Jesus was gone. But when Mary saw what had happened, she did pretty much the only other thing she could do. She ran to tell the others. Mary Magdalene went to Simon Peter and the other disciple whom Jesus loved and told them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they've laid him. Well, this was enough to get these two guys out of hiding. They took off running as fast as they could to that tomb to see for themselves. And sure enough, the tomb was empty and the clothes that had wrapped Jesus' body was still there. They stood there for a while, acknowledging what the, that what, what Mary had said was true, that Jesus truly was gone. Scriptures even say that the disciple whom Jesus loved saw and believed, quote, unquote. So at least one of them presumably understood what had really happened. Then we're told that they left and they went home. And they left Mary Magdalene standing there by herself, which is probably just as well because what happened next probably scared those guys half to death. While Mary's standing there crying, she bends down to look in the tomb once more to one more time. And sitting there where Jesus' body used to be, now are two angels. And they ask her why she's crying. And she tells them, they've taken my Lord away, and I don't know where they've laid him. As soon as she said this, she turns around, and she sees a man standing there. She doesn't recognize him, though. And, and, and when he asks her why she's crying, she figures he's a gardener. So she tells him, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, and I will take him away. It's at this point that Jesus calls her name. He says, Mary. She recognizes him instantly, and she says, Rabboni, which means Rabbi. That pretty much says it all. One word is embodied all the love, relief, the gratitude, the disbelief, the excitement that we'd feel if we were seeing a loved one who we thought was dead, now standing in front of us, calling our name. I think then we'd better we'd be able to better understand what Mary was feeling when she saw Jesus standing in front of her. I know there's many lessons we learned from this Easter story. And one of them is that Mary couldn't find Christ because she was looking for a dead Jesus. He wasn't dead, folks, he was alive. Many people still make that same mistake today. They keep looking for Jesus who lived some two thousand years ago. I'm impressed with him, what he said and did what he suffered. <clears throat> but they have no present-day experience of the risen Lord. They don't walk with him day by day or talk with him. They don't share their ups and their downs with him. They ex don't experience what it's like to discover him as one who is always with you and who will never leave you, <clears throat> no matter what comes your way. He is not a dead Jesus, but one who's alive and living in the hearts of folks everywhere. Second, even though Mary searched all over the place, she couldn't find Christ. It was Christ who found her. Isn't that what we usually experience even today? Isn't that the whole point of the gospel? That God is seeking us, not just when we've lost him, can't find our way home to him again, but when we're completely alienated from him, and we deliberately <laughs> rebel against him. Excuse me. You see, God never stopped seeking us out. God never stops drawing us unto himself, never. I'm reminded of a woman by the name of Teresa Hilker, who wrote about how her abusive father sent her and her siblings to live in separate orphanages after the death of their mom. Her childhood and teen years were painful times, and she grew angry and distrustful of others. When Teresa finally got to college, her college roommate was a Christian who tried to share her faith with her, but Teresa wasn't interested. She writes that one night she sat on a hill near the college and she had a conversation with God. In her writings, she says, I didn't confess my sins. I didn't ask Jesus into my heart. 
Instead, I blasted God with all the anger that I had, made sure I cursed and dared God to make a difference in my life. She goes on to say the married response of God, the married responses that God could have had makes my head spin. Teresa doesn't say what she was expecting. She may have expected condemnation. She may have expected punishment. Maybe she expected silence from an empty universe. What she didn't expect was to be overwhelmed by the very love of God. Teresa hadn't cried since the night when at age seven she was sent off to live in an orphanage among strangers. But that night, on that lonely hillside, Teresa wept for over two hours, just sitting in amazement at the love of God and how much love he had for her. Today, Teresa Hucker is a Lutheran pastor and a hospice chaplain. You see, God never stops seeking us out, and God never stops drawing us unto himself. So, people of God, on this Easter Sunday, it's my prayer for each of us that our resurrected Lord would open the very eyes of our hearts for all that God has for us, that we would know in our heart of hearts that he truly lives in our lives, in the lives of his people, wherever we may be, in our journeys of faith. And I pray it be so. And all God's people said, Amen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And so we come to that part of the service that we are calling spiritual communion. We miss the comfort of Jesus the Christ, Lord and Savior, brother and companion, who comes to us in, with, and under the forms of bread and wine during communion. From the depths of the reality of heaven, we are loved. So spiritual communion is a trust and an awareness, a prayer and an acceptance. God's love is really present, even when we can only be as present 
as our screens allow. I believe God's grace can work through and transcend electronic communication. Through our spiritual communion, the reality of Jesus and the Father's love, in and through the Holy Spirit is operating and present in our hearts and in our minds. And so let us pray. I believe that you are truly present in the sacrament of Holy Communion. Lord, I love you above all things, and I long for you in my soul. Since I cannot receive you in the sacrament of your body and blood, come spiritually into my heart. Cleanse and strengthen me with your grace, and let me never be separated from you. O Lord, may I live in you, and you in me, in this life, and in the life to come. And all God's people said, Amen. And so receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, Amen. God bless you. <laughs>